his servant. Amen. The Lord be with you. Hallelujah.
light for all creation, grant us grace to walk in His way, to rejoice in His truth, and to share His risen life, to live the reign with you, the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. When the day of Pentecost had come, Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to you. And he testified with many other arguments, and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added to their number. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The second reading. A reading from the first letter of Peter. Brothers and sisters, if you endure when you are doing right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that free from sins we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your souls. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church.
and climbs over elsewhere as a thief and a robber. But whoever enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens it for him, and the sheep hear his voice as the shepherd calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has driven out all his own, he walks ahead of them, and the sheep follow him, because they recognize his voice. They will not follow a stranger. They will run away from him, because they do not recognize the voice of strangers. Although Jesus used this figure of speech, the Pharisees did not realize what he was trying to tell them. So Jesus said again, Amen, Amen, I say to you, I am the gate of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved, and will come in and go out and find faster. A thief comes only to steal and slaughter and destroy. I came so that they might have life, and have it more abundantly. This is the gospel of Christ.
Well, the Fort Reed Mission was then called the St Kilda Mission. They met for worship first of all in um, the Fort Reed School, then the St Kilda Town Hall, and then um, as things began to pick up steam, money was brought together, a committee came together and some land was purchased. By 1911, Brian King had retired and was succeeded by the equally remarkable Daring Evans, who had come to New Zealand in 1910 with the great mission of help. The Anglican Church, or Church of England as it was called here in those days, seems to have slipping a bit and decided to call a, a big mission team across from England who would try to stage a parish mission in every parish in New Zealand. Well, Darren Evans went south at first, but he must have liked what he found because he stayed to become the Vicar of St. Peter's and was here for a brief period from 1911 to 1914. One of those well organised, um, incredibly energetic people who presses the start button wherever he goes. So he got the building that's now called Holy Cross St. Kilda. He modelled it on a mission hall he'd seen somewhere in uh, England. There was supposed to be another church after that. Um, and and there's a, remark a remarkable photograph in your hall, Holy Cross, of the ceremony of the literary pontifical high mass in 1912, where Derek Evans is being the deacon to Bishop Neville, who's got dressed up in a chasuble, a maniple, and a, an Episcopal mitre. Of course, Neville by this stage was the primate of all New Zealand. And although he kept this rather concealed, I mean, you know, he's followed Jenna, who had not been allowed to take up the position because of his so called ritualistic tendencies. In fact, Neville was a high churchman himself. He kept that rather quiet at first, but by this stage he had nothing to fear as primate of New Zealand and was quite prepared to dress up to the thought of the nines. So, at this very impressive pontifical high mass there with the curate. Uh, Reverend Coates being the subdeacon, inaugurated a regular cycle of services there in the building we now call Holy Cross, or come, came to call Holy Cross. And it was serviced at first by the clergy of St. Peter's, but already by 1914, the um, committee of Holy Cross was petitioning the parish to become a parish in its own right. Well, Derek Evans moved on to a very large Anglo Catholic parish in Baltimore. Hundreds of people went to it. And he married a millionaire's daughter. Uh, his father-in-law um, had given generously to the building of the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, New York, and um, was very influential there. At that nuptial mass, there were two bishops of the Episcopal Church doing the honours, both of whom related to the bride. And um, she was a woman given to mystical visions, which were written down in a book at the suggestion of her spiritual director, a member of the Society of St. John the Evangelist. Apparently she had very intense visions of Our Lady and Our Lord, and these were all factory visions, and I didn't know what that word meant. Apparently it means you smell as well as you see uh, scenes from Our Lord's life. Well, Darren Evans never stayed anywhere for very long in his life, went all over the world, real travel itch, you can pick up the Falkland Islands at one stage, until finally he was brought far for bombed him out in his church in Southwark during the war, and he died in the West Country shortly afterwards. Well, uh, Father Mortimer came along to be the vicar here in 1914. Another really interesting guy, he was the son-in-law of Father Burton, the guy who'd been brought in to St. Michael's Christchurch to change the world there, and my goodness he did. He turned it into the principal Anglo-Catholic shrine of New Zealand. Half the congregation left and more than half came and new people came in. And so Warner was a son-in-law, he'd been born in Shirley in Christchurch, and he came again very interested in Christian socialism, in guild socialism. He was a writer of um, plays, and uh, he made the decision that it's time for Holy Cross to become a parish in its own right, which it did in 1917. There's actually a photograph of Mortimer out there surrounded by his um, service of the guild, of the service of the sanctuary. And one of the really interesting things, the Heard family, they started off here. You know, the patriarchal Heard was a builder from the West Country who actually built the St. Peter's Vicarage in about 1913, which I call God's refrigerator. <laughs> I'm famous amongst my parishioners for my indifference to cold, to which I say to them, just as well, since this is the house you require me to live in. And um, his son, Stanley Heard, is one of those servers. He was ordained here in the 1920s, 
and really um, it's his ashes that now have been interred in St Michael's Clyde and this in turn has motivated the Heard family to save St Michael's Clyde and to reopen it as a spirituality and retreat centre good on the Heard family and they've been you know, a recurring feature of our diocesan life for quite a long time. Well, um, Father Walton died of consumption in 1920. Perhaps it wasn't such a good idea to have come to South Dunedin. You see that article in the OET last week about the huge uh, chimney stack there by South Road where the gas works were. Another gas works over there, and the railway shunting yards also would have produced very impressive levels of um, air pollution. So he died in 1920, and um, by this stage, Holy Cross had its first vicar, and um, you know, there's sometimes been a kind of strain, a bit of tension and ambivalence between our two parishes. And it was a kind of raw little situation through the 1920s, which might help to explain how that began to happen. Anglicans in the St. Clair area were keen to have regular worship taking place there, and they petitioned the Holy Cross vestry to ask that the boundaries of the parish could be altered so that St. Clair could be incorporated into the Holy Cross St. Kilda um, parish boundaries. Uh, well, the Reverend Wingfield, I think he was, was quite cautious about that, but it did get some support from the Holy Cross vestry, and a petition went forward to the diocese, which was very grumpily counter-petitioned by this parish, and about the boundaries remained the same. Um, I might say that you know, in the, that excellent history that Holy Cross has on its website, it, it says that one of the, the reasons for that is that the St. Clair folk were getting a bit jumpy about the ritualistic tendencies at St. Peter's. But I think there's a much deeper reason why they wanted to do this, and the thing that led to the creation of St. Peter the Less in Harges Crescent at the end of the 1920s. And it's something that's been revealed by the Cavisham Project. You know, more is known about life in this part of than any other part of New Zealand, thanks to the Otago History Department. And the parish history that I'm currently writing of this parish is a PhD thesis with that history department as an extension of the Cavisham Project. And what the Cavisham Project points out is that when men met each other in um, this part of the world, in that period of time, they ranked each other as to where they stood in the skill hierarchy. It was a predominantly working class community in an advanced industrial suburb. Remember, unlike British cities where the Industrial Revolution had come, which had been doing something else before, Cavisham and South Dunedin just sprang into existence as an advanced industrial suburb right from the go-get. So people ranked themselves, are you a journeyman? Are you a fitter and turner? You know, what's your skill level and your income level? And in those days, St Kilda, had a higher proportion of skilled working class men and white collar workers than Cavisham and South Dunedin did. Also, because land was cheap, young couples were moving there to start families. It was a very go-ahead area. In other words, what I'm saying is that on a class basis, an occupation basis, the people of St Kilda and St Clair felt more commonality with each other than they did with Cavisham and South Dunedin. And I think that helps to explain the desire to be together in that kind of a way. And there's a simple geographical reason too. If you're standing by the St. Clair Primary School and looking straight down Richardson Street, of course, Holy Cross is right there at the end of the road on the left-hand side. So there's more of a sense of geographical commonality too. Well, the boundaries remained the way they were, but a very formidable group of St. Clair matriarchs got weaving, raised a whole lot of money, bought some land in Harges Crescent. They then proceeded to buy up the now redundant Catholic Apostolic Church in the middle of Dunedin, got it moved to St. Clair and plonked down there, and the life of St. Peter the Less began in the late 1920s. Incidentally, the altar at the back of the church on that side came originally from the Catholic Apostolic Church and was there in St. Peter the Less. Well, in a way, St. Peter's rather protective policy boomeranged on, on it in 1930, because the St. Clair Anglicans, now with their own church, wanted to assert their own autonomy and independence increasingly. They found a retired priest called Reverend Rogers from Christchurch Diocese. He was a product of Warren College, Oxford. 
because we probably had a posh accent and made some clear people feel very at home. And, um, and they, uh, this was firmly slapped down by Canon Button, who was now the vicar of St. Peter's, who said, St. Peter the Less will only ever be a chapel of ease for the very young and the very old. The, the basis of life, our parish life, will function for this church. Well, St. Clair people were very unimpressed with this. The Guild fundraising group disbanded, several vestry members resigned, and several people stopped worshipping here. And it wasn't until about a decade later, under Archdeacon Pymore, that these wounds were healed. And you know, it's one of the great what might have been of Anglican religion in this neck of the woods. Supposing St. Peter's Cavisham had put St. Peter the Less on a path to eventual independence and autonomy, to assume its own parish status, perhaps now there would be a thriving independent parish of St. Clair. It's what we're thinking about anyway. So um, I want to leap across time. One element of commonality between our parishes is what the good old Canon Webb, the second letter of Holy Cross and Kilda, who was very interested in Eastern Orthodoxy and became very involved in the life of St. Michael's Fingal Street, sometimes taking services for them, and sometimes the Orthodox folk would join the Holy Cross folk for some of their major festivals. And of course, this very favorable sociology began to reverse for St. Kilda in the late 1960s. Neil Hansen, in his AGM report, draws attention to the fact that there are far fewer settled families in St. Kilda now, more flats, more transients, more single people moving through, and this was making life more difficult for Holy Cross and Kilda. And at the same time, of course, the late 60s is when that massive cultural shift begins, which we're now living through, in which the kind of um, Christianity and the church was now facing substantial headwinds. Well, in that next period of Holy Cross's life, of course, the next three beggars are ex St. Peter's Cavisham people. Roger Taylor from 1970 to 1977, who'd been here through the 50s and 60s. Then Dears Irwin, a, a, an, um, an ordinary of this parish. And then finally, um, John Teal. It was his final parish before he retired. So those three Cavisham priests saw Holy Cross and Killer through a very difficult time in its life. But it was still having its own vicar and, and maintaining things very well. And, and I remember, you know, some of our parishes, of course, come from Holy Cross. Kate Patterson, Nay Fowler, our people's warden, did, for instance. And she, I remember when we went to check out Holy Cross before we um, made the decision to, to uplift those four windows of yours, she said, in, in the 1950s, there was something on every night here, and the family services were packed. And I want to just finish briefly by talking about windows. Um, it was Kate Patterson's idea to put the Woodhouse window there at the link, and I think it was an inspired one. That was the easy thing to do. I'll come to the hard things in a minute. And um, when Kevin Casey was restoring the window and cleaning it before mounting it there, he said, look, there's been extensive damage done to this window at some stage, and somebody's expertly repaired this window. And reading your history, I found out exactly when that happened. In the late 1970s, Holy Cross was suffering from a lot of vandalism and theft. And somebody broke in at night and, you know, must have created what they call missile damage through the bottom of that window. Amazing to believe that up until the late 1970s, Holy Cross was left unlocked even at night. They did start locking it at night after that. And I want to finish by talking about John Brock, uh, the creator of many of these windows. Uh, John Brock, I gather, had a studio in Moray Place. He worked for another firm at first. He was also a painter as well as a stained glass merchant. Um, he created the ones around this church that have got, you know, servicemen or knights. Although South Dunedin suffered far heavier casualties in the Great War, um, this parish and a couple of its families uh, suffered repeated tragedies in the Second World War, and those windows are dedicated to them. And of course, two of the windows we've got from you now were done by John Brock in that late 1940s period also. The one, you know, Jesus surrounded by the small children, which is the War Memorial window. I love that window for the way in which, you know, the natural world, the, the, um, the beautiful soft tones of the surrounding 
world of nature is portrayed there. That's one of them. The crucifixion window, which I gather is a memorial to your first vicar, Albert Wingfield, uh, that was created then. And the one I particularly love, the Peacock Memorial window, or the Mary and Martha window as I call it. Because what that remarkable window done in the late 1950s, I think Brock had really hit a stride by then. And you know, often stained glass windows depicting biblical scenes as a frozen, lifeless quality to it. Not on that one. Somehow Brock's captured the pathos of the scene, the energy, the dynamism of these two very different kind of women who are very close friends of Jesus, and his very um, emotion, strong reaction to them. This scene really comes alive, together with the natural world, which again, in the background, is vividly alive and aware. And I want to say that those lovely windows, we are going to mount them, but they pose a challenge for us. We're going to spend the rest of this year thinking carefully about what to do. We're going to engage the services of an architect to give us some good advice. And then I'll tell you about two options we have right now which have got substantial fish hooks in them. Substantial fish hooks. We're reluctant to put windows into brick walls. The moment you do that, the cost escalates and it might compromise our attempts to earthquake strength in this building, which we must do by 2032. One thing you could do is put at least one of those windows, perhaps the very Martha one, up there. And they dreadful windows there in our East End. They were put there by William Robinson when he built this church in 1882. He was a grand mason, he got the masons to help with the paying for the church. He the Masons were there at the creation of Holy Cross and Kilda. And those windows say more about the Messiah order than they do about Christianity. And I'd love to put one of your windows there, but maybe even three if you remove the Marinos. But the trouble is that the moment you start piercing brick walls, you increase the expense, you create all sorts of interesting structural issues, and, um, and, and that would be possibly compromising the earthquake strengthening thing. The other thing we could do, and this was suggested by Kevin Casey, modified by David Hoskins, would be to put the three windows, remember they're each a triptych, at the back of the church there, one straight on, and the other two slightly flanking it, slightly angled, and off the ground, with a natural light from the west end falling through it. You'd put one of the altars in front of it, you'd move the, 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 um, uh, the font to over there, but the problem with that is you have a more vivid west end of the church than you did at the business end. And the other problem is that the natural light only falls through those windows in very narrow bands. It wouldn't light up the whole of the windows. The other problem is that this church suffers from rising damp, and the floorboards are quite springy you would have to replace them as well. And, um, yes, <laughs> the final problem. <laughs> You look at the west wall outside, it's leaning slightly outwards. And what would happen on an earthquake is it would fall right out onto the cottage. So there's formidable issues to think about here. That's enough for this morning. Uh, I am now going to put this microphone down and we're going to take a trip out to the Woodhouse window to dedicate it. Accept our offering of this window in which we now dedicate to you for the adornment of this place and the inspiration of your people. Grant that as the light shines through it in many colours, 
so our lives may show forth the beauty of your manifold gifts of grace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Almighty God, we remember before you today your faithful servant, Edward Woodhouse. And we pray that having opened to him the gates of larger life, you will receive him more and more into your joyful service, that with all who have faithfully served you in the past, he may share in the eternal victory of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We now go back to our seats and we'll get to say Let us profess our faith in the words of the We believe in one God, Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one God. Give your abundant grace to the people of Holy Cross St. Kilda, 
the elected gen and their lay leaders. We give thanks for the faithful witness to Christ in, this, in the surrounding communities of Musselburgh and St. Kilda. May the Lord and giver of life, the Holy Spirit, direct and guide their common life and all their goings out and their comings in. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Bless those who bring beauty and inspiration to God's house through works of artistic endeavor and skilled craftsmanship. We pray especially for the creators and restorers of stained glass windows. We ask God's blessing on Kevin Casey, who restored and mounted the Woodhouse window. We pray for the repose of the soul of John Brock, who created many of the windows at Holy Cross and St. Peter's. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the sick and the boom. We pray especially at this time for Claire Johnston, Jerry Gordon, Margaret Sterling, Malia and Shereen Napier, Jonathan Gillies, Katie Barron, and Bruce Moore. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray for those who have passed through the gate of death and entered into eternal life. We rejoice with them in the promise of more, of life more abundant than this world can give, where Christ calls to stop to be with them in glory. We pray especially for those whose anniversary occurs at the sign. Alfred Shetland, Belinda Thomas, Emily Idol, John Beatty, Eileen McLeod, John McGlynn, and Louise Lewis. Lord, in your mercy. May our prayers be accepted in the name of Christ, the Good Shepherd of the sheep.
why in great goodness we have received the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and be filled with your holy and life giving spirit. Thank you. 